くは。All right, looks like we are live. Yep. All right. Good evening, Defenders, and welcome to a very special episode of the Defender Fitness Alliance show.、Uh, so, many of you guys already know who I have with me. I've been letting you guys know for the past week.、Uh, this man, he is, he is a best selling author, a keynote speaker, and business consultant. He is the founder and CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp,、uh, one of the nation's fastest growing franchises, and an investor in over a dozen companies ranging from subscription software platforms,、uh, di digital ad agencies, as well as mastermind and coaching services.、Um, so he's known for as the hidden genius that entrepreneurs and best selling authors and thought leaders turn to when they want to create、uh, their high level masterminds and coaching programs,、uh, quickly scaling their businesses. Uh, making that leap to their massive success.、Uh, I have none other than Bejos Kulian. Bejos, first off, thank you for、uh, taking the time to be with us here. Absolutely, r e d d i n Thanks for having me, man. Awesome, man. So I wanted to start off,、um, you know, a lot of people know about you just through social media,、um, you know, the empire that you're building with Fit Body Bootcamp.、Uh, you know, you, got, you had your、uh, book that just came out a couple months ago, best selling book.、Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to start off with your, with your humble beginnings, right? Because、um, not, many, not many people, unless they read the book and actually purchased it, not many people know about、um, how you started and how you came to, you know, to the United States and you know, created this empire that you have now. Can you, go, can you tell our audience a little bit more about that?、Uh, where you、Absolutely. originally came from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I always say that I'm the immigrant edge and I'm the American dream. And what I mean by that is, My father decided in 1980 that we were going to escape the Soviet Union. And my fa father was a member of the Communist Party. And so, as you can imagine, we're going to make the great escape. And he's a communist. And of course, he's denouncing communism. And we want to escape to the United States. And at the time, the United States was considered the enemy for the Soviet Union, which is now Russia.、Right. And so, when we escaped,、um, I was six years old. It was me, my mom, my dad. And my older brother and sister. And dude, when we came to the United States, we were poor, we were broke, we didn't speak English, didn't understand the culture. And my dad had maybe $80, $90 in his pocket, and we had two suitcases for a family of five. That was it. And thankfully, he had a friend of a friend who lived in California, which is why we ended up in California. And that guy had said that we could stay in his one bedroom apartment for 30 days, for one month. Until we can get on our feet. So, literally, the second day that we were in the country, my dad already had a job. He had a paper route. By day two, he had a paper route and he worked at a gas station pumping gas. By day three, he had the paper route. He was pumping gas and working at a pizzeria and then got my brother a job at the pizzeria as a busboy. And so, you know, the whole family was working all these side jobs. And my mom was trying to raise me and make it all happen in those 30 days. Before we had to move out of this guy's apartment.、Um, the guy was not rich. He was just doing a friend of a friend a favor. And so we didn't want to impose on him. So any money that was being made in those 30 days from my brother and my sister and my dad was having to go towards the rent that we were going to need to pay for the apartment we were going to try and get. Well, as it turns out, the government would help us out through、uh, Section 8 housing, which is kind of a discounted. Rent for an apartment complexes that are otherwise pretty shanty, falling apart, you know,、uh, uh, just full of like cockroaches and stuff.、It、wasn't the best living, but hey, at least we had a roof over our head. And <laughs> just to kind of show the picture of how bad we had it. And I, and I always share this with people because when people go, man, I'm, I'm really down and out, you know, things、right. aren't going well for me, I have to remind them that did you ever have to learn the English language? First, before you could even make it in this country? No. Did you have to wear clothes that were found in a garbage dumpster、uh, before you could make it in this country? No. Did you, did you have to have government assistance with housing and food? No. Did you have to eat out of dumpsters? Like my dad, when he worked at the gas station, that gas station was in the shopping mall in this where there was a grocery store. And、uh, my dad had figured out that the grocery store throws away food that has either gotten rotten or is expired. And so the stores can't sell them. 
And so when a store can't sell it, they have to throw it away. And my dad would, you know, pick me up and boost me into the dumpster. And I would fish out all this food, bread and cheese and milk and eggs, uh, vegetables that were either semi rotten or moldy or just expired. And that would be our food until we can make enough money to go grocery shopping. So really it's all about the perspective that you have because when people go, I have a bad life sucks right now. And then they're walking around with an iPhone in their hands connected to the world. They need to realize there's people that are eating out of dumpsters, um, have to learn the language before they could even survive in this country, living in section eight housing. And in my case, even uh, the, the housing environment was so bad. I got lice um, the following year. I was seven years old. I got lice and my mom and dad couldn't afford lice treatment, dude. So my mom had asked my dad to siphon out gasoline from a parked car and she washed my hair with gasoline. And I don't share any of this stuff to tell people, man, I had it so bad and you have it so good. I share this with people to say that, look, I could have it that bad and still make it in this great country. Right. And having it that bad helps me appreciate how good I have it now. And so one of the things that people will ask me is, well, what have you learned since then? Well, I've learned that in life, when you don't have what you want, you have to get resourceful. And I'll give you a great example. My mom and dad, of course, where they wanted food from a grocery store, but we didn't have the financial resources to buy the food. So we had to get resourceful and find it in the dumpster. Uh, they wanted the money to be able to buy the life treatment for my hair. But since we couldn't afford that, my, they had to get resourceful and siphon out gasoline. And my mom washed my hair with gasoline to kill the lice. And so in life, oftentimes you won't have what you want by way of resources, whether it's money, whether it's access, whether it's someone's time, whether it's an opportunity, but that doesn't mean you stop or consider yourself a failure. That's when you start getting into resourcefulness. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned being an immigrant to this great country of ours. Well, thank you for, sh for sharing that story. And um, it's a story that I think um, everybody needs to hear, right? Because um, a lot of people, uh, now just focus nowadays on where you're at now, what your status is now. And they tend to forget uh, all the struggle and the, the failures that you had prior to that. Yeah. And, um, you know, also being an immigrant myself, uh, coming to this country when I was about seven years old and like yourself, not knowing the language, um, you know, with my parents that have much, actually, I mean, I didn't go dumpster diving for any food. Uh, or clothes or anything like that. I wore my cousin's clothes, but the only issue was she was, uh, you know, my cousin was female. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had it worse than me, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I remember getting made fun of because I wore her shoes to school. But you know, hey, we we had yeah. to make do for with what we had. But um, yeah. yeah, I think it's just important to hear that nowadays. And you know, you talked about being resourceful. Um, what? How? How can our? Um, you know, with us as personal trainers and gym owners, how can we be more resourceful nowadays? Dude, that's a great question. Because when you think about a personal trainer or a gym owner, you think about all the competition around you right now. The economy is doing so well that there's a ton of competition in every single city. It's not just in California. It's not just in Florida and New York. It is like across the Midwest even. There's serious competition. Yeah. And so people go, well, how do I stand out? How do I differentiate? How do, we, how do I become resourceful when I don't have the marketing dollars to uh, the marketing resources? Well, it's really simple. I always tell people, do you have clients who have gotten results? And they, you know, yeah, of course I do. Even if it's just like two or three clients that have gotten amazing results. When was the last time you asked them genuinely, like Mrs. Jones, since I've helped you get amazing results, can I ask you to help me get results? And the results I want with my business is to impact the people in this community. Can you refer two or three of your coworkers or your friends or you know family members to me? It's very rare that people will go, gym owners and personal trainers will go to that extent to actively ask for a referral. Sure, you might get a referral here and there, and that's because you did a good job and a client goes, hey, let me let me introduce you to my friend, but imagine you can 10X the amount of referrals you're getting simply by actively asking for it in the way that I just shared here with you. And that's just one way to do it. For example, another way is look, if there's a whole bunch of gyms around you, then all Mrs. Jones is doing is she's price shopping. When she's ready for a personal trainer or gym membership, she's calling and saying, how much do you charge for personal training or boot camp or gym membership? She's literally making the decision based on price. But if you were the personal trainer that decided to step out of your comfort zone 
and take your iPhone and start making how-to videos every single day and put it on Instagram and Facebook within a month. Those how-to videos, how to get flat abs, how to eat healthier when you're out, how to overcome emotional eating, uh, how to burn two inches off your waist in 30 days, how to get flatter abs doing this one exercise. Like there's a million things that we can do how-to videos on. But if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and do these how-to videos, soon the people in your community who are looking for a personal trainer no longer see you as just another gym and someone who they're going to price shop. But they go, you know what? I trust Redden because every day he's pumping out great content. I used to not know him. He was a suspect. Now he's someone that I trust. So we we as gym owners, business owners can go from being a suspect in someone's life to being someone that they prospectively want to do business with to being someone that they know, like, and trust. Like that's the process you have to take your leads through at, well before they become an actual lead, well before they give you their phone number, before they give you their email address, any of that stuff. But again, that's resourcefulness. No one is willing to step out of their comfort zone and for 30 days commit to every day creating how-to videos on Facebook and Instagram because if they did, soon, while everyone else is being price shopped, you're seen as a local expert and authority. And Redden, I'm not going to price shop you because I feel like you have so much credibility with the content you've been putting out that if I want the best results, I'm just going to work with the guy or gal who's been putting out the great content. So just basically putting out more, more of yourself out there. Um getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Um, for, cause for some of, cause for some of us, you know, we might not be comfortable in the camera, but there's a, there's some things that we need to do to get our name out there and, you know, get those customers, right? Absolutely. Everyone thinks that, man, if I just, you know, I hate the phrase, you need money to make money because that's the biggest lie people tell themselves to not make money, to stay broke. Well, the reason I'm broke is you need money to make money. You do? You need an iPhone and a connection to the Wi-Fi that everybody has, and then you can start creating literally how-to videos all day long. You can start making, get your client that you got great res results for uh, and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, how many inches have you lost working with us? Oh, I've lost, you know, whatever, 14 inches across my body. And how many pounds have you lost? 36 pounds. And what did you hate about working out? And I've, I've hated this and that and the other. And what do you like most about working out with us? And you pump out testimonials and how-to videos. The problem is, most people would rather pump out excuses than pump out resourcefulness and testimonials and how-to videos. Well, I can't. Oh, I can't do this. I don't have enough time. Why, why, why should I do that? You know, they, they come up with reasons why they shouldn't when they should, right? Exactly. And, you know, we could always justify what we're afraid to do by coming up with excuses of time and money and I don't know how and I'm too busy but we certainly make time for the things that are a priority to us because I guarantee you, the average person who uh, 97 times a day, uh, the average person checks their phone on just on Instagram alone, 97 times a day, over 270 times they pull out their phone to do something, to send out a text message, to go on Instagram, to go to Facebook, YouTube, whatever. So you take that accumulated time and you go, hey, look, you, you had the desire to do that. If you just have the desire deep enough desire to get the clients, you would make those how-to videos, then you'd get it done. So you're right. People do make excuses instead of getting results. So I'm um, just going back with, you know, getting more clients. Do you, uh, do you recommend when you're starting out focusing on one, you know, like they say, a customer avatar, one specific client or doing like everybody in general? Very good question, man. Yeah. I absolutely suggest that people focus on one type of client. And here's what I mean. A medical doctor, like your, your family doctor, makes about $130,000 a year because they are a general practitioner. Like when they come out of medical school, their title is a medical doctor, general practitioner. That's the family doctor. Now, a specialist, like a brain specialist, a heart specialist, a thoracic specialist, they typically make Four hundred to six hundred thousand a year because they specialize on a certain part of the body, and so just like that, we fitness professionals should operate the same way. If you say, "Look, I can train male or female, eight to eighty, bodybuilding, weight loss," well, now you're just a generalist, and you're generally going to make okay money to survive. Dude, I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. I want to dominate. I want to put my competitors out of business because if I feel I'm the best personal trainer in town, then 
if you were to go to another personal trainer, I would be doing you a disservice. The only way for me to dominate and thrive is to say I specialize in a certain type of client. That might be like, for example, I've got a client named Chris Tatula. He's in New Jersey and he's got his whole program is based on for guys. And he, the whole program is called the strong SOB program, the strong son of a bitch program. <laughs> That's it. He targets men and his business is thriving and growing month after month because he knows who his avatar is and he understands their fears, their frustrations, and their desires. See, if you're a generalist, eight to 80, male to female, you can't, you don't know a young girl's desires and fears versus an old man's desires and fears. And the bodybuilder wants to have certain desires and passions versus the stay at home mom. So you, if you target it like fit body bootcamp owners, we really target the stay at home moms. Like 89% of our clients are women who stay at home. They don't want to be wearing a bikini and doing a muscle contest, any of that. They're not about to join a CrossFit competition. They simply want to have a toner body. They want to burn off fat and inches, and they want to have a more positive, optimistic mindset. And we focus on that. We know what their fears, frustrations, and desires are, and we market to them. That is our avatar. So if you can nail down who your avatar is, you can absolutely market better, sell more effectively, and retain clients for the long haul. Mm, awesome. Awesome points, man. Um, so just talking about marketing, um, let's say for the gym owners that are listening right now and, and guys make go ahead and drop your questions for, for Bejos if you have any, man. Um, so for, for, you know, talking about marketing for gym owners that are out there, maybe they're struggling with attracting clients. What are some ways that they can use, um, I guess some marketing tips that you can provide for them uh, for those that are struggling to, to attract clients? Yeah. is this go find 50 people who are influential in your community and train them for free and i know that sounds crazy wait a minute i can't train people for free how am i going to pay for my rent i don't care go get a day job for now go get a side job go work at night but if you have zero clients and you've got zero marketing dollars go find 50 people in the community like a school teacher the the bank president the guy that owns the car dealership or the general manager of the restaurant that you like to go to train them for free for six weeks give them results and say look Red, and as long as I train you for the next six weeks for free and give you results, do I have your commitment that you'll tell your friends, family, coworkers about me during those six week process? And you might say yes. Now, the reason I would say get 50 people, and we call this the human billboard project, is when you get 50 people that you're training for free, half of them are going to fall off immediately within the first two weeks. So now you're stuck with 25 people. Of the 25 people, half of those people, so 12 and a half, are actually going to be the ones that finish a program and get results and give you referrals. But the people they referred to you now, if 12 and a half people each send you just two clients, now you've got 24 clients, 25 clients who are paying people. So the human billboard project takes a whole bunch of effort, zero dollars to get done. And that's how it works. The next level up is if you have some clients, they're getting great results, but you don't have enough clients, then you've got to start asking actively for referrals. The easiest way to do this is when you sign up a client. So Redden, if you just signed up with me, I would say, hey, Redden, welcome aboard to Fit Body Bootcamp Chino Hills. Redden, as I help you achieve your fitness and fat loss goals, can I count on you to help me achieve my business goals, which is to help 3,000 people here in Chino Hills over the next five years? And you might say yes. Well, over the next 30 days, as I help you get results, I'm going to come back to you and say, hey, Redden, remember what we said? As I help you get results, will you help me get results? The answer is yes. Now I'm going to say, Red, and look, you've lost weight. You've lost inches now. Names and phone numbers. And say, hey, look, Redden wants to offer you three free workouts at our location here. So actively froze is huge. That's thing number one. Thing number two is, again, goes back to our phone. Gratitude. Gratitude text messages. One of the fastest and most effective ways to get people to give you referrals are to take all your clients and text them one at a time. Hey, Redden, just want to thank you so much for coming in for an awesome workout today. We had such a fun time training you. By the way, we're never too busy for your referrals. If you have friends, family, coworkers that you want to give three free workouts to, just do an email or text introduction. So again, actively texting gratitude and then finishing off that gratitude text with 
can you refer friends or family or coworkers to us? The third way up that food chain is everybody should be building an email list. Odds are you already have an email list because if you're a personal trainer or gym owner, you probably have select unified place like Champ or Fit Pro Newsletter and mailing out consistently with great content people like email marketing, you're going to start offering them 14-day fat furnace promotions and 21-day rapid fat loss program, or hey, this week we're giving away three free workouts to the first 10 people who reply to this email. And so email marketing is so effective, yet so many people go, I don't collect email addresses and the email addresses that I do have, I don't actively market to them. So start marketing to them. Now we're getting a little more sophisticated. The fourth and final way, and there's literally dozens that I teach in my courses and stuff, but the fourth and final way is to actively pay for traffic, which means you're gonna have to start running ads in your community. And this goes back to your other question that you said, should I just generalize and have a whole bunch of people that I train or should I specialize and have a targeted avatar? This is why you want a targeted avatar because now you can go on Facebook and say, listen, show this ad to only women who are within three miles of my gym. And if that ad speaks directly to that woman's fears and frustrations and desires, she's more likely to click on that, click on that ad, go to your website and take advantage of the free workout or two weeks for $25 or you know, six week transformation program that you're selling. But if you're, if it's a very general ad that says, Hey, want to lose weight, want to put on muscle, want to lose inches, want to have more energy, click here. Well, and you're targeting men or women, eh, that's pretty vague. And so you're going to get vague results. But if your ad says attention, Chino Hills, women want to lose pounds and inches, have more energy and do it all with just three times a week, 30 minutes at a time. If so, click here to try Fit Body Bootcamp Chino Hills for one week for absolutely free. Like it calls out women, it talks about what they want, and it talks about how quick, fast, and effective the workouts are. And then the call to action is click here to get a free week. Like that is a very targeted offer to a targeted audience that's going to get targeted specific results. And uh, not enough people are willing to buy the traffic. And, and by the way, just because you get the leads, like let's say someone clicks and says, yeah, I want a free week. So they give you their name, email, phone number. Uh, the biggest problem here that I see red in is the follow-up. So now we're kind of deviating from marketing and going to, how do you get that person? So I'll hear, well, Bedros, uh, you know, 26 people filled out the form for a free week, but none of them came in. And I'll say, well, did you follow up with them? Oh yeah, an autoresponder email went out when they filled out the form, but no one responded. Or we put in one phone call and they didn't pick up the phone call, the phone, or uh, you know, listen to the voicemail. You got to do an active monster follow-up campaign. Like if Redden fills out a form with his name, email, phone number for one free week, I'm not going to assume that he's so excited that he's going to come and work out with me. I'm going to assume that you filled out the form and now you're mentally checking out. So I've got your phone, I've got your email address, mm -hmm. and I've got your name, dude. I'm going to call you. I'm going to text you. I'm going to send you emails five days in a row, twice a day with passion, with enthusiasm, but with persistence until you sign up or tell me stop contacting me. That's called monster follow-up. And the people willing to do the monster follow-up are the ones that make 200, 300, 400,000 a year. The people who don't do the monster follow-up just go, hey, my leads were crappy. There's never crappy leads. It's crappy gym owners and entrepreneurs. Yeah, those are, those are some great points. And I hope you guys are taking some notes because he mentioned four, four keys to uh, you know, attracting more more clients. Um, so going back to your, your last point, Bedros, um, you know, talking about calling and emailing and you know, uh, trying to get an answer. But you know, there's some um, personal trainers that are out there that might be asking or wondering, like, well, I don't want to be too salesy, or um, I don't want to seem like um, I don't know. How do how do they get over that barrier of like, you know, yeah. be becoming a salesman and then you know trying to help. Uh, make a change in somebody's life? You know, I hate selling, dude. I hate selling, but I love transforming lives. And I'm convinced that Coca-Cola and... ...opposite, they love destroying people's lives. Like, I'm convinced they're willing to... 
things and sell the products. My I will do the things that will be. And so fitness professional to get my message in front of the right people because if I don't monster follow up aggressively, then they may end up eating more Jack in a Box, McDonald's, or even worse, I think, buying some goofy little product off an infomercial that says you can work out at home and get results, but they don't have the proper coaching, they don't have the proper motivation, therefore they're not using the equipment, not getting the results, and they're out the money, and now they're back to emotional eating again. So if you stop looking at it as selling and being pushy and start looking at it as I have an obligation and a duty mm -hmm. to take the service and product that I have and to literally force it on the people who need it, who need it. Listen, sometimes you'll see cops take people by force who are drugged up and going crazy. They take them by force because those people are, a, are, are, are basically hazardous to their own health. Sometimes you have to buy, and I'm not saying like, go grab a client off the street and drag them into your gym and say, buy my training programs or else. <laughs> but I'm saying if they've given If you look at it as well, I just feel like a used car salesman. Wow. Then my argument is, do you feel like your product is a used car thing? I don't. I feel like I've got the superior thing, like with my business, whether it's my coaching or my Fit Body Bootcamp franchise, I've got a superior product and I've got a duty and an obligation to get it in your hands. Because if I don't, you're going to use an inferior product, get inferior results and die. And I don't want you to die. Mm. Perspective. <laughs> Perspective. Yep. Uh, so I, uh, I got a question from one of our uh, members here, John. He's asking, what are or were your biggest challenges you faced when you first started your own business? The biggest challenges that I faced when I first started my own business were not knowing the things that I'm sharing with you. Because I just assumed that I'm in great shape. I'm nationally certified personal trainer. And I just opened up an amazing looking gym. If you build it, they will come. What I didn't know that you have to build it and they won't come. Then you have to market the hell out of it, sell like the Dickens, deliver results, they'll create an amazing community, ask for referrals, and then they will come. Like that's the thing. Like no one, I didn't have a mentor or a coach. And so those are the challenges that I had to face. So I just waited around. Okay, there's no clients. What do I do? I guess I'll put lead boxes out. And when I was opening up my five gyms back in the day, I had no Facebook. I had no, you know, internet access. So I was putting lead boxes out in restaurants and hoping that one or two lead boxes would be enough. Thankfully, I had a personal training client who was a very amazing entrepreneur. His name is Jim Franco. And Jim said, hey, look, you got to get more lead boxes out there. You got to ask your clients for referrals. You got to go talk to local businesses and see if you can get those local business owners to come work out with you, get results so that they can tell their customers about you. And he taught me the idea of having multiple pulls in the water. See, I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to have one pull in the water, like three or four lead boxes out, and that's it. Little did I know that there's like multiple revenue streams, multiple lead generation streams, and I got to have all the pulls in the water because it's going to increase my likelihood of getting more clients. And so those are the challenges that I had because I didn't know what I didn't know. And this is why I'm so like adamant about sharing this with people worldwide. So... um some of our members, you know, some of them are still active duty. How do they, how do they balance or, or, I mean, I, I know we talked about this before. Is there any balance with entrepreneurship? Good question. There is no balance with entrepreneurship. <laughs> and if you're an entrepreneur, you have chosen to not do the nine to five and that's, that's, that's okay. And the people that have chosen to do the nine to five, that's okay too. Look, we're all, you know, there's people that are gifted. They're super tall. They have the ability to jump. They've got great hand-eye coordination. And they are literally have chosen basketball as their career path. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be a basketball player. I'm just not gifted with those skill sets. However, I've chosen the path of the entrepreneur, which means I've chosen to not have balance. I've got a work-life mix, but I've got no balance. And people who say, well, I'm active duty, or I'm a father, or I'm a parent, or I'm, I'm a single dad, I always remind them of, uh, you were at the Conclave of Warriors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember Ray, Ray Kerr, the, the short Navy SEAL who was speaking? Yep. Well, he's still actively deployed, not for the military anymore. Not, not, he's not in the SEAL teams anymore. He's now working for a three-letter government agency, and he's actively working overseas 82 days and then comes back and then runs his business. 
And recently I've started helping him and coaching him and guiding him along. And the guy is connected to the internet from his iPhone, from his computer. So he's overseas in Benghazi, still running marketing campaigns, creating how-to videos, doing the things he needs to do to get the results that he wants. Because the, otherwise it's an excuse, goes back to, we can make excuses or we can make results. Yep, great point, great point there. Um, another question from Joanne, how did you decide where to put your Fit Body Bootcamp? as far as like locations and stuff uh, i guess yeah for locations yeah is we look for the communities that have at least thirty thousand people in the city or the area that we want to serve that the income is middle income or higher and that it's mostly you know homeowners and we found that obviously women who live in homes and not apartments for the most part, um, with communities of 30,000 or more residents with middle income or higher are the ideal communities for us. And then we put them in shopping centers that have what we call complementing businesses, a hair salon, a nail salon, a day spa, a uh, Starbucks. And those are complementing businesses because we know those businesses serve as magnets to attract mm -hmm. our prospective client to that shopping center. I mean, basically just being where your customer, your, what we talked about earlier, where your customer avatar is and yes, sir. Pla placing your business in there and attracting them. Um, another question from Vinny, uh, what does, what do you consider more important, the brand or the individual? Oh, dude, you totally cut out. Can you say oh. that again? <laughs> Yeah, uh, another question here from uh, Vinny. What what do you consider more important, the brand or the individual? Uh, I guess he, he he puts out an example: creating a new business, market yourself at the same time as marketing the business. Good question. People buy from people; they don't buy from brands. So unless you be, I mean, you look at Apple. We were buying from Steve Jobs. We weren't buying from Apple. We were buying from Steve Jobs because he was such a dynamic force. You look at Microsoft. We were buying from. Uh, Who's the founder of uh, app of Bill Gates? Bill we're Gates. buying from Bill Gates, right? And so when you you look at Tesla, we're buying from Elon Musk. And so when you're a startup business, and even when those companies were starting out, and even when they became established, the face of companies stayed forefront. And people buy from people and not from brands. And that's I'm a big believer in that. And so if you create on, on the same day, you create a personal account and a business account on Instagram or Facebook, your personal account will grow three to five times faster than your business, even though you're the CEO of that business. Like my account says, Pedro Skoulian, CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp. Right. And Fit Body Bootcamp is growing much slower, the Instagram page, than the Pedro Skoulian one because people want to know who's the face behind Fit Body Bootcamp. What is, what is his mission? What is his vision? What are his core values? What does he believe in? What does he not believe in? What are non-negotiables for him? How is he, is he, is he money driven? Is he impact driven? See, people make decisions based on all that stuff. And so if we don't put that out there, they look at the business, they go, well, the workouts look great, but I don't know who the face behind it is. So it's important to be able to really identify with the face of the business. And it all goes back to what you stated before the no like, and trust factor. They, they yes, sir. Buying their services from, um, yeah. you can trust them. Um, all right, more, more questions here. So uh, I got one one final question, uh, Vedro. So for personal trainers that are just starting out, um, you know, trying to build their uh, their businesses, um, you know, it's some say like the fitness uh, industry is oversaturated. There's so many different types of uh, characters and and uh, and and that sort. How do we, how do we stand out? How do you how do we stand out from uh, from all the noise that's out there? Good question. So the way you stand out from all the noise, because the fitness industry is oversaturated, but it's like, so what, what are you going to do about it? The, we can wait till the market crashes. And when it does, all the riffraffs will go away and the badasses will stick around. That's what happened in 2008 with real estate and fitness. It'll happen again when the economy crashes until then you don't just try and deal with it. You try and stand out from the noise. So the way to differentiate yourself is who's willing to pump out before and after pictures faster than everyone else. Who's willing to pump out more content 
than anybody else? Who's willing to align themselves with the big businesses in their communities more than anyone else? If you're willing to do those three things, pump out more testimonials and before and after pictures, pump out more content and align yourself with all the big players in your community, the big businesses that serve your customers or your future customers, you're going to dominate. But again, people are afraid of rejection. They're afraid of going out of the comfort zone. They're afraid of doing all the things that are necessary to grow. And so they live in a mediocre and neutered life. And guys, don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, like guys like Bej I mean, Bedros, I follow him on social media and, you know, I, I bought some of his books, but I mean, he's been so responsive through just on Instagram whenever I did uh, message him. And, you know, we met in um, the Conclave of Warriors a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we set up this uh, interview and, you know, hopefully in February, uh, we'll get to meet up again. Yep. Just, just go out there and make connections, man. Um, so Bedros, how do, what do you, um, what do you, uh, what's one ad internet resource that you can kind of provide for our listeners uh, to help them out in their fitness business? Good question. One of the best resources that I can provide to the listeners of this particular episode is my blog, which is free. And it's got almost a decade worth of marketing, sales, branding information for gym owners and personal trainers. And that blog is ptpower.com. ptpower.com is all my free resources where anyone who wants to grow their gym, become a better marketer, get more clients, differentiate themselves, can get free information. And I believe it's important to do that. Another place to do that is my YouTube channel. Again, a decade of YouTube videos all on how to grow your personal training gym. And but again, people have to dedicate themselves to watching the videos, reading the blog posts, and then taking action. If they don't take action, they just watch the videos and read the blog post. All they are is information gatherers. But if they do that third step, take action, now they become entrepreneurs who are making money and making an impact. So that was uh, ptpower.com. Um, that's Bay just... Uh blog make sure you guys check that out it's free and also check out his youtube video it's very informative um don't have to pay for it as well um Bedros, what's your definition of being fit dude my definition of being fit today is different than it was probably a decade ago a decade ago it was how much can i pr on bench and squat and deadlift uh, these days, I'm 44 years old. I'm in better shape I've ever been. I've got abs. I'm functionally strong. So my <laughs> definition of being fit is functionally strong and of sound mind and of good sleep. If I can have a pe peaceful mind, get good sleep every night and be functionally strong, meaning I'm strong and I can do movements that I use every day, I'm happy as they come. Awesome, man. So, um, you know, coming to the end of our uh, interview here again, thank you for your time. And guys, make sure you, uh, you continue to follow Bedros and uh, check out this, this uh, interview later on as well. Um, so I got five uh, questions for you, Bedros, five final questions. Uh, what's your favorite workout? Uh, favorite workout, probably uh, narrow grip cable rows. <laughs> That's, why, I mean, why, why? That's my favorite exercise. exercise. Uh, my favorite workout would be anything to have to do with pulling. Uh, I, I've got big traps and a wide back. And for some reason, I'm a better puller than pusher. And so my favorite days are always back days. The back days. All right. What's your least favorite? Oh, man. Least favorite have to be shoulders. I have so much like weird little pains in my shoulders. Um, that doesn't mean I don't do it. I just warm up and do mobility for like 25 minutes. Like, People think my workout is my mobility. And then I finally start my workout 25 minutes later. And they're like, oh, now you're working out. Because I have to do so much warm up and mobility for shoulders before I can actually get into it. All right. So um, next question. If you had to choose one person, and I know you've been seeing your Instagram, you've worked up with a lot of people. But if there's one person that you wish you could train with that you haven't, who would it be and why? Uh, it would be Oprah Winfrey. I would love to train with Oprah Winfrey because I think she's a very – very strong-minded, strong-willed yeah. human, and I'd love to be able to ask her questions while we're working out. Um, I, I've always found that when you're working out with people, you really get to see the real them, right? Because you get to see, are they going to stop when the set gets heavy or the muscles start burning or they're panting for air, or are they going to keep going until they finish the set? 
And so, um, you know, for me, I'd rather, I'd like to work out with Oprah because I think it would be a really good opportunity to tap into her wisdom. Yeah. Great point. Just talk to her and get, get some of that knowledge. Yeah. And our next question, uh, recommend a book, except for Man Up, recommend a book <laughs> for our listeners to read. Oh, absolutely, man. Um, a book that I would recommend for our listeners to read is, I can think of three right now off the top of my head, but you said one. So the one book I'm going to recommend, and I'm actually looking at it now, is called Psycho-Cybernetics, and it's by Dr. Maxwell Maltz, and it helps people fix their limiting beliefs by fixing their self-esteem and self-image. Because I believe, listen, if someone had high confidence, high self-esteem, high self-image, they wouldn't be worried about rejection where marketing is concerned. They wouldn't be worried about, oh, I'm gonna look stupid if I'm making a selfie video. They would just make all those things that I said they should do. The only thing stopping people from doing what I said versus doing what, you know, not doing what I said is self-esteem and self-image. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Self-image is how you think people feel about you. And so Psycho-Cybernetics is an amazing book written by a plastic surgeon who figured out that people want to get plastic surgery because they feel like my confidence will improve, my self-esteem will improve once I get my ears fixed or my nose fixed or I get the boob job. But in reality, they still are limping along in life because they haven't done the inside work, the inside plastic surgery. And that's actual self-development work. Mm. Awesome, man. So psycho cybernetics, psycho cybernetics. Yep. Awesome. Make sure you guys check that out. And now last question, tell us your favorite quote and why. Ooh, my favorite quote, my favorite quote is circumstance does not change responsibility. And that to me uh, was told to me when I worked at Disneyland as a bus boy and I was dragging ass and working slow. And my manager came up to me, his name was Doug. And I talk about him in my book, man up. And Doug's like, hey, kick it into second gear. We've got people who are all over the world, came from all over the world to Disneyland to eat here, kick it into second gear. And I turned around to him and I gave him an excuse. Well, I'm tired. I didn't sleep well last night. And he said, you know what? Circumstance does not change responsibility. The fact that I was tired or hungover or hurt, none of that, none of that matters to the little boy or girl who's in line to eat at Carnation Cafe at Disneyland and then to go on their favorite Dumbo ride. And so it doesn't matter how you show up you still have a responsibility to the task at hand, finish it, do it and do it better than anybody else. Mm. Finish strong and uh, complete the task. Right. All right, guys. Um, So Bedros, thank you again for taking the time uh, to being with us here in our community, guys, make sure you guys watch this later on. Uh, Take some notes, make sure you follow Bedros. How how can, uh, how can people follow you Bedros? Uh, easiest way to follow me is on Instagram. I'm very active on the Instagram platform these days. So just follow me at Bedros Koulian on Instagram. And guys, make sure you drop him a DM. Say thank you and uh, hashtag our Defender Fitness Alliance, man. Yes. All right, guys. Uh, Bedros, again, thank you for your time. And uh, I'll see you guys soon, guys. All right. Keep changing lives. See ya.